Welcome again to another episode of the Tongan Legends Podcast. We're very excited to have you all here today again. And uh, mahalo, mahalo al pito for all the support and love and offers that you all sent to us. Uh, we love all the support we get from our family, friends, and all those who have recently joined. And um, just want to give a shout out again to everybody that's uh, uh, watching and listening. Mahalo al pito to uh, Woma Katea, Cameron Van Wagner for hosting us and for uh, having the idea to to run this podcast today we got a special episode for you we're going to finish off the major lines that we talked about we started talking about regarding the origins of tongans we're now on the fourth line family and that will be focused on what we call the nafanua line even though it doesn't start with her that's what it's called because she's such a prominent uh figure in this line um but before we move on just want to go ahead and encourage everybody again to like subscribe to our videos our channels right uh if you get a chance in the comments below not the comments the description below we're going to go ahead and put uh links to the facebook page the instagram page and so come on there and join us in the conversation so anyways uh we're going to now just move on to Nahawoma, to wakona go ahead and start us off with the story and you know uh just malo pito again brother for hosting this Malo, malo, pito, malo, lava, mai to all of those who are listening. And malo, ulise, you're getting really good at that. <laughs> malo, malo. No, it's a pleasure. I just, um, I mean, you know, I appreciate you. And if you don't know, then I want you to know that I appreciate you. I appreciate everyone um, who um, has contributed to this. And listeners, like all you listeners and watchers and commenters, um, thank you. We love the interaction. Um, so as you said today, we're going to be finishing off the kind of last line in the original four lines that started in the Tongan creation story. If you're unfamiliar with that, go ahead and check out our first episode. So it'll be right after the intro- introduction, the Tongan cosmogony or the Tongan creation story. And that will kind of talk about these four different lines. Real quick, just to review, the first line was Piki and Kele, and they, had, they eventually had Hikuleo who is the goddess of Pulotu. So that's the spiritual realm and spiritual world. The other line is Atungaki Maimoa Longonoa. They were kind of the elements or the creations of the sky world. And they eventually had the Tangaloas. And, you know, Hawaiian is Kanaloa. Um, Modi is something similar as well. Um, Tereo Modi. And so that figure is a very large figure throughout the Pacific, much like the next line, where we had Fonu Uta and Fonu Tahi, they created or they kind of, their realm was the underworld, which is where the Mauis come from. Also another very, very well-known um, line throughout the Pacific. And so we're actually getting to the last line of the, uh, the last fourth line of this, um, where we have Hei Moana and Lupe. Now, if you remember, Hei Moana was in the form of a Tukuhari, which is a sea snake, the black and white sea snake that you guys will see in the in the ocean if you're ever in Tonga or, or just in videos and stuff. And Lupe. So Lupe was, Lupe means dove and Lupe was in the form of a Lupe. Um, one thing the stories mention is that she, um, the word maybe is like not, not very strong at flight and almost crippled. So she was, she kind of lived on land and flew around land and in the trees and stuff while Hei Moana lived in the sea. But they um, came together and they had two offspring and those offspring were Toki Langa Fonua and uh, Hinatua Ifanga, um, who were brother and sister. And our story starts with the first son, Toki Langa Fonua. Now, just as a um, trigger warning, maybe would be the right word, or <laughs> um, oh, this, yeah, yeah. this. Oh, so, so one, I've, I've heard some comments and people have mentioned how like they knew that there was Hey Moana and Lupe, but they didn't know that there was a line that followed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this story is less talked about than the other stories. And when we get into it, there'll kind of be an obvious reason as to why. Yeah. Um, but it is a part of, you know, the, the Tongan creation story. And it's also a part of the larger Pacific um, story, as some of these characters will talk about we find elsewhere across the Pacific. So it's important to recognize these lines. And then also, even though some of it is uncomfortable to talk about, mm. um, it does affect Tongan culture, how it developed, how it plays out and, and Tongan culture today. So we are going to talk about it. 
um, before I start the story or anything, I just want to hufang afagatapu, you know, be as respectful as possible um, because we will be talking about some things, you know, that, like I said, get uncomfortable for some people or maybe really funny for other people. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where I stand yet. <laughs> um, anyway, so we'll go ahead and start the story. So at this point in time, we already have Ewa created. Um, much of the islands in the Pacific are already created. And this is kind of the beginnings of Tongan society. Um, so in this legend, Tokilanga Fonua, the son of Hei Moana and uh, Lupe, comes down to Ewa. He's sent down to Ewa. Some people say he's sent from Langi, the Tangaloa domain, the sky domain. Um, but essentially, he's sent to Ewa to kind of be a ruler or a king or a god over Ewa. And he's, he's there alone. Um, and he's there for a while. And eventually, um, his sister, who he doesn't actually know yet, is also sent to Elwa. Or she comes down to Elwa. Now, this is where it gets awkward, right? So Toki Long of Illinois, he's you know, walking through the forest, whatever. He comes across this woman, right? And he's like, ooh, woman. Um, much like the Greek gods, uh, Tongan gods very much had human urges and abilities i guess yeah and so his um his human urges kind of took over and before you know he cut straight to the the chase and grabs this woman and they um they mohe they mohenga they share a bed right afterwards you know after the deed was done and you know his mind kind of came back to normal or whatnot um he's like hey yo by the way who are you and she's like, oh, I'm Hinato Aifanga, and I'm looking for my brother, Tokilanga Fonua. And he's like, oh, my goodness, right? And he is just completely embarrassed, just, you know, filled with shame, of course, as yeah. as today anybody would be like, hey, if you didn't know your sister and then ended up hooking up with your sister. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> just imagine how that feels. So he he takes off. He cuts. He's like, you know what? You stay here in Elwa. You can have Elwa. I'm going to leave. I don't want to look at you. I don't want to look at this place. Like he's just so embarrassed that he decides to take off. So he actually leaves and eventually makes his way to Samoa or in the stories, Ha'amoa, of course. Um, what he didn't know was that he had actually impregnated his sister, Hinato Aifanga. All right. So Hinato Ifanga gives birth and she gives birth to twin girls. And it's said that these girls, Mahanga Piki or Pipiki, they're Siamese twins. Um, and they were named, she named them Nafanua and Topukulu. So eventually, as you know, these, these girls grow older, um, they kind of decide they like, hey, you know what, we want to go find our father. Um, and so they they're they're grown now they're you know able to go out and whatnot and so they start and they swim in their of their goddesses so they can swim forever right or whatever it's interesting because they when they get so they they swim in the swim and then they actually reach samoa or haamoa mm. and they are they go on the beach and they're really tired from their swim and while they're resting there on the beach or while they're there on the beach tokilanga fonua comes out and he's like hey women I like women, right? <laughs> um, so he kind of like, he chases after these twins. And one of the legends says, some of the legends say that he actually had an, an axe. And his name, Toki, Toki means axe. Mm. Toki Langa Fonua means, um, Toki is axe, Langa is to build, and Fonua is land. So his name is the axe that builds the land or axe that builds the land. So he has his axe and he, he ends up splitting the twins so they become individuals instead of Siamese twins. Um, and then, you know, he grabs them. That happens again. And then afterwards, he's he's like, oh, by the way, who are you guys? And they're like, oh, we're Nafanu and Topukulu. We're actually here to find our father, Tokilanga Fonua. Now, if you thought he was embarrassed before, you can imagine how he's feeling now. And he's probably just like, I really got to stop shooting first and ask <laughs> questions later, man. Good analogy. <laughs> So he's just like, oh my goodness. All right, you guys just whatever. Yeah, I'm out. And that's kind of like, that's, that's as far as this story goes, that's the last time we um, see or hear about Tokilanga Fonua. He might come up later 
fast for now. That's kind of the end of his story. So the twins are like, okay, yeah, we came and met dad. It was kind of awkward. Um, let's go back home, right? Mm. So they, they start to swim back to Ewa. And as they're swimming, they realize they have, they've also been impregnated with, um, you know, by their father. And they, the first one to give birth is Topukulu. And Topukulu gives birth to a boy who ends up getting the name Hei Moana Uli Uli, which would be his grandfather's name with Uli Uli at the end. And because it is a child of incest, and you know it's it's a shameful thing you don't like hey hey, who's the father of that child it's actually my dad slash uncle you know what i mean like she she decides to get rid of the child she decides to leave the child in the ocean and hopefully and hoping that it would drown and die um it's the grandson of a sea snake however so and has the name of the sea snake so he actually you know turns into a sea, sea snake as well and he's able to survive and leave um after Topukulu gives birth. Nafanua also gives birth to a girl named Tafakula. Now, Topukulu says, hey, you know, I got rid of my kid. You know, just do it. Just get rid of your kid. Um, then, you know, we can avoid that shame. It's just, it's a child of incest. We don't want it, right? So that's what Topukulu is pressuring um, Nafanua to do, but Nafanua is like, no, I, I want to keep my child. And so she ends up keeping the child and, and taking um, Tafakula, the child, back to Elwa. Now, when they get back to Elwa, they're kind of, they become the more prominent gods. Nafanua is more well known among them, and, and the people of Elwa would worship them. Um, or petition them when it came to any almost anything particularly agricultural or issues to do with nature so these gods had something to do with controlling um, nature or they involved with that in some sort of way um, the story doesn't end however so Tafakula is at the beach one day or something and then hey Mana Uli Uli who is the son who was cast out to sea he comes up on shore and he's like hey woman and yeah it happens again so the, um, I guess there's their first cousins at this point who, yeah, it's a complicated family vine in this story. <laughs> oh, yes. But um, they have a child named Lofia. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, Ulisse, but I believe that they were also kind of like, hey, Tafakula's like, hey, you know what? I'm a child of incest. I don't want to have a child of incest. Yeah. Um, let's just get rid of this mm. one he decides to get rid of Lofia and they throw Lofia off into the ocean mm. and that is essentially the story eventually Lofia actually goes and becomes the Afi the fire in the Moong Afi in the volcano in is it Kao? Tofua. Tofua in Tofua yeah. so Kao and Tofua are two volcanoes in Hapai yeah. so he he ends up becoming the fire in Tofua mm. um like I said before Nafanua becomes Nafanua and, and her sister Topukulu become prominent figures in Ewa's, you know, mm -hmm. um, mythology or what's the word, theology. Yeah. And yeah. So anyway, that's essentially the story. Like I said, it's kind of awkward because you got like yeah. brother and sister make child and then children make children with father who's also uncle. Right. Who's So it's like, anyway, it's complicated, right? Yeah. Um, as far as these names, Tafakul, or do you want to talk about, yeah. or do you have any, I guess before we continue, Uli said, do you have any like insights on the story or yeah, things you want to add on? Right, right, right. No, no, no. Awesome. Malo alpito ngawoma. Thank you. Um, again, yes, we just want to emphasize again, you know, everybody that this is, this probably is, it's probably one of the most awkward stories that we've had to cover. And I think that I've ever read or heard of in Tongan culture and Tongan history. But, uh, and, you know, we apologize, you know, we, we don't mean to come off uh, crass or crude or, you know, or to offend anybody, you know, just like uh, how I said, you know, you know, we're, we're not trying to make fun of the situation either or make light of these type of things. But, you know, it, it's a, it's one of our oral traditions that have come down to us Um uh, but it does have some really significant uh, 
uh, realities today. And, and that's kind of what we're going to discuss about today, you know. And so, malo pitong ahawama for for telling us that story. And I, I really don't have anything to add, no, to um to the story itself. Beautiful, malo pito. It's very different, um, <laughs> very different story. I'm like, wow. Uh, but uh, no. Uh, would you like to go over the cultural aspects then? You know what we see then today, the cultural um, implications. Um, yeah, so actually, you know, as we're talk- sitting here talking about it, it's also, I kind of want to talk about some of the historical and maybe scientific stuff that was going on. So, Definitely. you know, reminder, we, we, these legends aren't just stories that people made up. They're based, we believe, again, yeah. um, and everything we talk about is just our beliefs and opinions, right, right. of course. But we believe that these stories kind of stemmed from the earliest ancestors of yeah. Tongans today. Yeah. Now, before we jump in and like, oh, that's so nasty, that's disgusting. Realize right. back during the early migration periods, right. um, you had people on ships and they, they weren't huge boats with, you know, 50 to 100 to 100 plus people on them all the right. time. In this beginning part In of this migration. beginning, exactly. yeah. Like eventually Tongans and the Kalia could actually get to the point where you could transfer 500 people yeah. you know, from, from, from Hapai to Vavao and, and things like that. Um, which was actually also really dangerous because oftentimes the canoes flipped and you lost 500 people or a couple hundred people, <laughs> um, just as a note there. But in this early age, remember, people were going out um, and they were looking for land. Yeah. And a lot of times you might, I, mean, I, I don't know if anyone's ever sailed or like you hear, there's so many stories where someone gets blown off course. Someone gets lost at sea. There's instances, you know, where cannibalism takes place, um, you know, on stories of people coming back from Fiji because they learned that there or, or different things. But if we're thinking way, way back in the beginning, you and a small amount of people are venturing out into an ocean where all you see is dark blue and light blue and a ball of fire in the sky and some clouds and some sun, the stars. And But for the most part, it is... It takes a lot of skill to do what your ancestors did. It takes an incredible amount of skill to do that. And a lot of people probably got lost at sea. A lot of people um, probably died at sea. I remember reading, I was actually, I was in the Niwas, I was in Niwa Toptapu, and there's an old um, kind of historian dude who was living there. He was a European man and he had read a lot of books and had a lot of books and he was doing some studies or whatever. And he was saying, look at, like, look at the people, especially early accounts, you know, again, and again, like, unfortunately, most of the early accounts we have come from European sources right, right. Um, because writing, you know, the sources we have right now are the ones we're talking about from Tongans. It's the legends, it's the oral histories. But as far as the written accounts that we know of, Europeans described Pacific Islanders and Tongans as a very robust, tall, strong, um, you know, energetic, vital people. They had clear skin and, and good teeth. And they were, there were very few diseases, few to no diseases among the people. Um, and there are, I mean, even Captain Cook said, he said when he was in Hawaii, he's like, there are 10 year old boys in Hawaii who go and play for fun and surf that my best sailors and best watermen wouldn't dare go near. You know what I mean? That's, that's the kind of people that were in the Pacific at this time. And if you think about where those people came from, I always think about something I was taught as a kid. So my all but one of my grandparents um, come from pioneer stock is what we call it, meaning that their ancestors were American pioneers who came walked across America to the West in utah where we are now um and during that period if you were sickly if you had a disease if you were kind of weak in any way um because of the winters you faced and walking and shortage of food and just the demands the physical demands that it had on your body you would die so it's what you were left with was this kind of population that had gone through a refiner's fire and and been like it's just like we're like most people in my family or whatever were 
pretty naturally strong, um, you know, like healthy mm -hmm. people. Like we don't deal with a lot of diseases and stuff. We don't deal with right. a lot of stuff that a lot of the world deals with. And I think that's very similar to Polynesians, like mm. in and in Pacific Islanders. I don't mean to separate separate right, right, out, right. but especially uh, let's you know talking right. about Tongans in particular, the diseases that Tonga deals with are not shit like genetic diseases like right. mostly it's heart disease diabetes right um stuff like that those are those are diseases we're dealing with because of an introduced lifestyle and change right. in diet it's not something that is prone it's prone among polynesians because i guess they were so healthy before or among tongans right and so the way that happened the way tongans i believe became this vital strong people was going through that crucible of sailing across the ocean, yeah. being lost at sea sometimes. You know, sometimes not everybody got lost at sea, but a lot of times right. you got blown off course. It took you months to get back to where you needed to be. So if there was anyone weak or anything in your in your boat, they might have died. So a lot of these early societies in the Pacific were started by small groups of people, you know, maybe even individual families. And eventually you all become family. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, even today, that's a theme in culture today and something we always joke about, right? Like, oh, you meet a girl, it turns out, you know, she's your cousin. Like yeah. nine times out of 10, any Tongan girl you meet is going to be your cousin, right? Kind of thing. <laughs> Not that often, but it, that's like, right, it, right. that's a part of, that's a part of culture today. And yeah. it's kind of showing how Tongan society grew. Um, what I like about this legend is that it's showing, it's, like at one point in time, incest was necessary uh, because as a human species, remember, every species on this planet has a the natural urge to to survive, yep. to, per, per, to perpetuate plants, yep. plants like weeds are some of the best ones because they grow yep. in an environment where they're unheated and they create seeds and they like everything we do. We eat, you know, our, our urge to eat, our urge to drink water, our urge to breathe yep. is, is the same thing that urge to repopulate. You know what I mean? It's this natural Thing. So at one point in time, and we see this in the early stages of the Tongan mythology where, you know, all of these sets of twins are all having children. And that kind of incest was necessary. But what I like about is this legend is we get to a point when the incest is, you know, disgusting. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting. So and if you ever read the book, The, the Better Angels of Our Nature, one of the things that that book talks about is anything we view as disgusting is actually bad for us, right? So, for example, you know, as humans developed, we started seeing things as gross because it's bad for our development. Or so, for example, like eating eating off of a dirty plate, we see that as gross. Not necessarily. We, I mean, early people didn't know about germs. You right. know what I mean? But they still saw it as gross because even whether they knew it or not it was detrimental to their health because of the germ and everything like on that. We see that in this situation too, to whereas, the, whereas these, these ancestors are starting to recognize that incest is not a good thing. And then I also like the point that when Nafanua and Topokulu are born, they're actually born with deformities. Yeah. So they're Siamese twins. They didn't develop properly in the womb. And we know that that is a result of incest. So from this story, we see the point in time where, you know, early Tongans were developing that, mm. that I guess we call it some people, you know, morality mm. and some issues with the morality issue. Um, but they were just developing that understanding that, you know, if you, if you don't have a diverse genetic pool, you're going to have issues. And that's what we see from Nafanu and Dobkul. Um, so those are just, that's more of a historical scientific side of things before we go saying, oh, these people are gross. These people are so nasty. Right. Right. Um, we're actually learning from this legend. Yeah. You know, where like one, yes, it's something that we don't want to go on. And mm -hmm. then we also learn because the, the twins were born with birth defects. There's also, there's also a bad result of it. So this yeah. story could have been taught to be like, Hey, you know, just, this is not something that we want to do. And there are yeah. serious consequences if this is if this happens. Right. So I that's. Think I, oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. 
no no yeah i think that's exactly it like like what we had said you know we're not sharing the story to to gross people out or to make fun of the situation but it's it you know we have these stories to learn from and that's what we should use them for to learn from to see where we are at today right so um so you, you you talked about the the historical the scientific background of this story well what about um is there any cultural implications you can see that now let you know would you like to move into that uh what what, what do you see could be the cultural implications now as talking to people seeing this story of uh ancestral relationships how do we deal with that um i don't like i don't want to be the voice so back, <laughs> so uh, for those of you who don't know my degree is in pacific island studies but i right. i finished school in 2016 so almost five mm -hmm. years ago um and so during my time you know i i read a lot of stuff and, a, and i i'm sorry that like i don't have actual references to everything that i'm talking about and that's why i say it's important for you guys to realize this is like our thoughts our opinions yeah. they come from what we've learned and what we've studied but yeah. something I read once, and I don't remember particularly who it was. I know that Okustino Mahina, mm. when he talks about the creation story, he talks he talks about incest. And I don't know if this is from him or from another scholar. Um, but one of the aspects of today's relationship between siblings is very much kind of influenced possibly by this story. This is yeah. one of the original main stories. Yeah um where all of this stuff is happening between brothers and sisters yeah right so it's likely that because of something like this happening there was a set of rules that was created to yeah. prevent it from happening and so my belief is that yeah. some of the the respect between brothers and sisters and and how that is how that goes about comes from comes from this story or the, the situations like these yeah. Whereas Tongans realize, we, you know, we live in a really small place yeah. and there are not a lot of options in the dating pool. <laughs> so sometimes this stuff does happen, um, but we need to make sure it doesn't happen because it's yeah. detrimental to our society or to, our, to the well-being of, of right. our descendants. Um, so we're going to set these rules in place. And I believe that a lot of those rules are probably still in place. So some of those being like, you would never go into the bedroom of you know a sibling of the opposite sex yeah um particular i mean boys even it goes to the point where there's a full a whole separate home or a full separate yeah. fale um for the boys while the while the girls you know live inside yeah. um and are kind of watched over by the parents you and there's other rules too like so for example like a lot of you are probably uncomfortable watching movies with your siblings of the opposite sex especially because yeah. a lot most movies have some sort of kissing scene or some sort of sexual innuendo. Um, you never would totalo, which is kind of like telling dirty jokes or or cape cape or swear um, in front of your sibling of the opposite sex, right? Like so, anything that could even mention like you always have, you know, you're always properly dressed. You're always sitting yeah. up. You're not laying down. Laying down, yeah. Any little thing that could perhaps maybe trigger uh, an, we would call it indecent thought or a, like sort of thing around your sibling. Those things are very, very, very forbidden. Yeah. Because, and because probably because the origin of the society where you had, where you needed to make sure that because of the small society you live in that, you know, people weren't getting lazy and just choosing someone they were relative to, to, to be their unoho, to be their mate or their spouse. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I think, a part of the cultural, as far as the stuff that happened in the story, um, I think that's probably a part of it. But I don't know what you think. No, yeah. I think you're right. I think this story is one of the stories that helped to influence our Tongan culture today with the brother sister relationships. In Tongan, we call it Veitapui for those listening, you know, um, that Veitapui, that, that sacred va relationship is is so key in our Tongan culture and society right so i think this is one of the one of the stories not the only story you know as 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 cameron talked about one of the stories that have influenced the way we see our relationships between myself and my sister or you know yourself and your brother or whatever you know and so um very important we see a lot of uh 
uh, cultural implications today. We, we see the effects of this type of story today. Um, so malo pito ngahomo for bringing up those things. Uh, um, those of you listening, I wanted to also uh, give a quick background of this story. Not the story, the the resource where we got this story from, right? Um, uh, it's actually a, a translation. So like like Wakona had talked about earlier, uh, a lot of the written records we have of our oral traditions and histories and uh, come from Europeans, right? Living in Tonga or working in Tonga, or whatever, and then they would go and interview, you know, the chiefs or the normal people and just get stories and collect and write it down. This one in particular is uh, uh, taken down by a Catholic priest, yeah, um, and and so it's actually written a French priest actually, and so it's actually written in both, um, in Tongan and in French. So it's very very interesting um, when you see the descriptions he gives. Uh, his name is Ryder, and we will, and I'll we'll post a description, not a description, a, a citation for that, in the description of the video, where you can find this. You can find it online. Trust me, you can find it online. And he's written like a bunch of other stories from Tonga in Tongan and French, um, so you can compare. So if there's anyone listening that speaks French and would like to help us to translate, you know, maybe doesn't work correctly, the translation, you know, would love to hear your translation of it. But um. It says that he had gotten this uh, descriptions from another French uh, Catholic priest who who had interviewed one of the chiefs in the in the time. You know, I guess he was sixty years old, or it was sixty years since he had received these stories. Um, and so, it, you know, he he enjoyed listening to these stories, and he said it was it was told. You know, it was so fun. The, you know, the way the so exaggerated these stories were. Um, but that's how we talk. So I think it's important to recognize that too, just so people know that where we, where the source where we got this story from. Um, but today in Tonga, you can actually see the names of these this story uh, still in Elwa, still in Tonga today. Uh, the name Tafakula is actually still used today by um, his line of family and one of the uh, major Matapure or talking chiefs for the island of Elwa he is the the latest Tafakula. Right, so it's really cool. Um, the wharf or the harbor, not the harbor, the the wharf where the boats come in and dock at in El was actually named by King Taufahau to Po the Fourth after Nafanua, so it's Nafanua Wharf. Um, so these things are still there, um, still around. Um, before we end, you know, I know we have a little bit of time left, but uh, Wakona, I wanted to share actually one of the latest discoveries. Um, people um, have been talking about, and big shout out again to. Um, David Takairi uh, for sharing this um, new scientific discovery. It's, it was going around on Facebook for a little while, a few months back, but uh, still really relevant to this story. Anyways, um, some of the archaeologists in Tonga, um, Palangi archaeologists, uh, most notably David Burley, I think is his name, discovered, him and some other um, Palangi archaeologists have discovered a new species of lupe. Um, uh, so like Wakona was explaining earlier, lupe is uh, the, the, the word, the Tongan word for a dove or a dove is a pigeon, right? A type of pigeon, um, fruit pigeons usually in the Pacific. So this new type of actually giant pigeon was found in cave. The bones were found in a cave on Ewa. So very, very interesting, you know, and these were about... Uh, five times heavier than the normal pigeons we have today. Uh, they're about 21 centimeters long. So these are big birds, man. Um, and it's so funny that they were found on Elwa. And uh, it's no surprise, right? Um, Wakona talked about the creation of Elwa. You know, the first man, um, Tokilanga Fonua, to go to Elwa, his parents is uh, He Moana, He I Moana, the sea snake, and Lupe. Um, so, you know, the fact that they found it in Ewa and they've actually found, starting to find other remnants of this giant pigeon in Ha'apai, uh, mainly there, Ha'apai and Ewa. So this is really cool, really good scientific discoveries. And we see the connections again, right? Ewa and their, and, and their legacy with Lupe. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to share a little bit of that. Uh, anything else, Wakona, that you can think uh, we can talk story about with this story? Um, it's it's not a really famous story, not a really popular story today in Tongans. Like, Tongans don't know it, especially Tongans outside of Tongans don't know it. But um, 
uh, I think it's good at least that they have a knowledge of it because we can see again the implications. Yeah. Um, no, nah, not really. I think that's awesome though. It's it's interesting that you know Lupe of all the different Manupuna. I guess we have like um, who is it? Um, the Atulongolongo. Yeah. Who who becomes the Q? Yeah. Yeah. The Turi. Um, so it's interesting. Like of all the creation stories, there's very, you know, very few specific creatures that are embodied yeah. by gods. And if one of exactly. these was the Lupe. I I bet I would I would say that that newly discovered lupe, especially if it's a giant, it's the biggest bird, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that that's probably the lupe that the story is talking about. Yeah, I think that's probably the kind of the species yeah. of dove or pigeon. Exactly. That this story is talking about. So it's cool. It's cool that you know we've had these stories, and when we know that this this figure is important, um, and we also know that in Tonga, the lupe is important. You know. Yeah, very much. Um like you know different parts of viney you know shout out to viney viney (laughs) folks out there like lupe is a big part of you know viney's story because the yeah what is it called the hufanga lupe the hufanga lupe yeah there's a natural landmark there and so it's just exactly this this bird was a significant bird now when you think today like why would a little pigeon be significant (laughs) well maybe it wasn't maybe it was actually this this giant pigeon yeah um that was five times bigger yep. than today's pigeon and i can i can definitely see how that would have been a very important part of right you know early life in tonga is that it's a big species that probably yeah you know is very significant it definitely but, played a part i mean i think we talked about it a little bit with the tangaloa clan you know pigeon snaring you know for those who don't know uh, one of the big sports for the especially for the tuitonga line uh for the chiefs was to catch pigeons was to be able to net them it was a it was a big sport it's very difficult and you know the fact that the lupe still continues to play an important part in our culture even our language we use a lot of references to lupe or lupe cat um pigeon catching um even the mounds that they used to build to stand on to catch we still use that in talking language all the time and so you know there's definitely you're right there's the big importance of the lupe in our culture still today yeah absolutely well this is like yeah like we said this story is not very well known but it does um have certain cultural implications and i and i think understanding you know where we come from, like you know where traditions where ideas come from yeah. um has a big part of you know you can better you can better do and you can better discern like we talked about in the maui episode you know sometimes um there are certain things in different cultures, like, you know, traditional Tongan culture in this instance, that's very important. In other instances, it's good to let go of that aspect and do yeah. something else. So I think this also adds to different lessons we can learn and things like that. And then it's also interesting the different connections to Elwa, the different titles, like you were saying, yeah, and the different names. Oh, and another thing is, is Nafanua is very big in Samoan yes. culture. I was going to say, you should bring that up. <laughs> I can't believe we almost forgot about that. That was yeah. one, of, one of the biggest things. I mean, yeah. obviously, Maui and the other gods are also big across the Pacific, yeah. um, particularly among, yeah. you know, Polynesian cultures. Um, but Nafanu is also one of these figures. And it's interesting that in this legend, we actually have evidence of her going to Samoa. Going to Samoa, yeah. And, yeah, maybe we'll... um be able to get into that in a future episode talking about the connections <laughs> between Samoa and Tonga and the legends. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, yep. But yeah. No, I just, again, thank you all for coming. Um, yep. If you do want to share our information, I mean, I feel like Guy Momoa trying to, hey, you know, share this. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> like, subscribe, no, share. share. <laughs> um, hopefully, you know, it. our hope is just by telling these stories in English, um, it, we're, we we just want to be a benefit to our Kainga, um, especially, you know, both. Yeah, I grew up, you know, the, the Tongans that I grew up with, um, you know, were born and raised here in the United States for the most part. You know, the kids were at least the, my peers and as well as, you know, Ulise from Hawaii and living parts of his life in Hawaii and Utah. Um, we hope to just create something of value to our friends because you you guys 
are the guys you guys are the people that we grew up with and the people that we love and respect oh yeah um i mean we we love and respect our kainga in the you know in the fondo of anga in the homeland as well um for me it's my uh my adopted homeland i guess <laughs> um yeah that's your homeland it's okay <laughs> but yeah and then yeah so ofalahiatu thank you again for tuning in would you say anything to finish yeah. out with Nope, same thing. Mahalo. Mahalo, Alpita, everybody. Please, yeah, like, subscribe, share. Share, share, share. You know, we want to spread the knowledge. That's a big part of what we talked about in the Maui episode, you know, sharing the knowledge so we can all, you know, come to a better place as a, as a people. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, comments, please comment on the, the YouTube videos, on our Instagram. Hit us up. You know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, put, a, we'll put a link into our, our social media. Um, hit us up anytime, talk story. If you want to join in the conversation, please join us. So, um, malo pito again, ngawoma, fakatou katea, hono fakapa mai, etau polokala, mago enig, hengalwope. We're very appreciative, honga ia moni ho, ho, ofalahi ke, ke fono katonga, pe pe fongi motaukai ngatonga. Um, everybody, malo pito, and we'll see you in the next episode.